Our third speaker in this session comes from a very different uh, background and case study, and uh, that's an example where um, the business has been taken over and uh, the main investor is an overseas investor along the supply chain, and we've certainly been hearing a lot of discussion about that supply chain interest uh, in some of the presentations today. So our next speaker is uh, Alec Osborne, who joined Tully Sugar as CEO in May 2012. Uh, and Tully Sugar has been a wholly owned subsidiary of Kofco Corporation of China since July 2011. Prior to joining Tully, Alec worked for Louis Dreyfus Commodities in Australia from 1999 to 2011, holding various positions including Managing Director from 2005 to 2011. And he's past president of the Australian Grain Exporters Association and holds a Bachelor of Ag Economics from the University of Sydney. So to provide a, a quite a different perspective and a different case study, uh, please welcome Alec Osborne. Thanks, Beck, for the uh, opportunity to speak last this afternoon. Uh, I, I've rationalised that a little bit uh, after sitting in the room all day. You're probably all operating at about far north Queensland time at the moment, so you'll be able to slow down and keep up with me. Um, I've got a very simple uh, presentation, I guess, to, to make this afternoon. It's, uh, it's what happened at Tully Sugar and, and actually a lot of similarities with uh, what uh, Barry was talking about in terms of the uh, originally uh, cooperative structure and the change to an unlisted public company that happened uh, back in the early 1990s. But then the access to capital, uh, all of those things were, were things that Tully had to, uh, had to deal with in the past. Um, as Mick said, we're acquired, uh, wholly owned by uh, Kofco Corporation out of China uh, in 2011, and I, I joined almost a year after that, uh, and came into this very interesting cultural dynamic of uh, the former Far North Queensland Farmers Cooperative, uh, un unlisted public company that had been held uh, very closely by a, a small group of local shareholders, and, and let me tell you, you don't know what it is to be a sugar milling town until you go and live in a sugar milling town. Uh, meeting up with Chinese investors who uh, have a very strong and deep understanding of agriculture and supply chains, very uh, heavily invested in a whole range of products and, in, and agribusiness in China. But this was their first uh, international uh, investment of any scale. Uh, and, and so I'll, I'll talk a little bit uh, about uh, our experience. I'll also touch a little bit on, on why I think Kofco made that investment in Australia and it's a, it's a whole mix of, re of different reasons uh, and, and some of their expectations. So there's, uh, there's the mill in, in Tully um, and uh, it's the second newest mill in Australia starting in 1925, the newest one up on the Atherton Tableland is, uh, it was, was built or, or just recently expanded, uh, but built in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, it was originally a government built mill and, uh, and then became a grower owned cooperative and then in, the, in 1990, uh, a public company. But as I mentioned, that, that shareholding was very local amongst the farmers. So they'd made the transition from uh, company to shareholders uh, but it's still held very closely in the community. Uh, the, there was a 20% cap on ownership uh, that went very quickly once the, uh, once the bids got to the right uh, level with the, the interest from overseas. And uh, the growth in the, in the company had been funded through uh, uh, cooperative member subscriptions, uh, through retained earnings, shareholder contributions, uh, and through debt, but I would have to say that uh, by the time we're in the mid to late 2000s uh, and after seeing how low the sugar price could go, there was probably a, a, a fair degree of uh, angst about the thought of taking on uh, more large debt. Um, this uh, evolution, or the slide, this slide's quite important in terms of the evolution. So. Um, Sugarcane is a, is a crop that's got a five to six year life cycle. You pop it in the ground this year and you mow, it's just a grass, 
Uh, you mow the grass the first year, second year, third year, fourth year. If you're lucky, you get a fifth year out of it. Then you uh, turn it over to a fallow and um, in year six, seven, you're putting it in the ground again. And so one sixth of your, uh, your production area is generally in fallow. But that crop cycle is in, important uh, in context of uh, how long it takes for the supply in terms of the number of hectares that are producing cane to, to change. It's not uh, one where people shift in and, out and shift out uh, terribly quickly. Um, this, uh, this period through here, which was um, uh, cut off on the side there, that's actually showing the, uh, the area of cane and then the blue bars are the, um, the, uh, the tons of cane crushed. That area that was planted to cane was, was really a function of the prices that had existed uh, through the late 1990s and the very early 2000s when the Australian dollar dropped uh, to 45, 46 cents, wherever the lows were. Uh, and, and production had been maintained. Plus, as you can see, uh, production was fairly high. Yields were actually quite good through that period. Uh, and so farmers stayed in uh, cane production after Brazil came on the scene. Now, when Brazil came on the scene uh, with a real that was six to one against the US dollar and drove sugar prices down from uh, 10 to 12 cents a pound down to seven and a half, six and a half, four, and a half cents. Um, and Perry here uh, surrounding a bit, he remembers uh, that. That, um, that changed things for Australian growers. All of a sudden, Brazil was super competitive uh, and Australia was not. And uh, Australian sugar industry was in no shape to compete against Brazil. They had not seen that coming. Uh, what happened to uh, area? It uh, took a dive. It took a real dive and it was compounded uh, uh, with uh, damage from the cyclone Larry in 2006. Uh, but also there was an alternative and growers uh, took up that alternative. They sold their land to the MIS tree schemes who didn't care that those returns had another four years to live. They ripped them out uh, so that they could go and plant trees. Um, uh, the uh, things didn't get a great deal better for a while. Um, 2010 was an extremely wet harvest. Uh, granted, the MIS schemes were, uh, were well and truly on their knees by then, but uh, uh, in terms of uh, they weren't demanding more, li more land. But um, the, uh, the uh, wet harvest of 2010 was compounded by, uh, funnily enough, very high prices for sugar. And what I mean by that is that um, you can see that by 2009, 2010, we'd started to, to bring area back into cane. So price, the sugar industry was starting to respond to better prices, but um, in 2010, those prices got too good. And the wet harvest meant that the whole crop couldn't be, uh, couldn't be uh, delivered and uh, a lot of sugar had to be bought back at the very highs of the market and uh, farmers had to reach into their pockets in order to, uh, to uh, pay back the margin calls, essentially. Uh, and, and you had the situation where when Cyclone Yazi came through in 2011, Tully Sugar actually needed to be raising uh, or getting access to capital to make sure that it had the capacity to handle these re this recovery in the crops. Their last major expansion had occurred in, 2000, uh, sorry, in 1997. Uh, and so some of this gear was getting, uh, like an old car, was getting around, um, uh, getting around 15 years on it. It had quite a bit of mileage on it. And uh, they needed to um, uh, upgrade, they needed to refurbish some of this equipment. Uh, typically, Tully Sugar would have gone to uh, its shareholders uh, and um, uh, retained earnings, dividends, uh, but Tully Sugar themselves didn't have as much of that as they would have liked and the shareholders weren't there to be tapped into because they'd just been flattened by a Category 5 cyclone uh, and, uh, and a number of other problems with their, with their production. So uh, it was what you would call tough times and all of a sudden uh, Tully Sugar was there as takeover target. Sorry. Um, no, uh, so Tully Sugar was there as a takeover target. I guess um, 
there were two things also happening at that time. One was uh, there was domestic uh, consolidation seeking to occur. So MSF was uh, Maryborough Sugar F Factory, which was a listed company, owned the Maryborough Mill and also the Mulgrave Mill. Uh, they were looking to join up with Tully and there'd been this long-held dream of the, uh, of the mills in the north all getting together. And, uh, and uh, Maryborough tried to bring that through. Uh, with a bid for Tully Sugar in 2009. That ultimately wasn't uh, successful, but at the same time we had the international play into Australian sugar occurring. Uh, so that was when uh, Wilmar bought the former CSR sugar mills, the Sucrogen assets, which were at the time over 50% of the sugar mill, uh, cane crushing capacity. Uh, and, uh, and at around the time, Midpole, a uh, large Thai miller uh, bought into Maryborough Sugar Factory and actually uh, realised with Maryborough some of that northern consolidation of the mills by buying the uh, Bundaberg uh, northern mills, the uh, South Johnson Mill, which is just 45 kilometres to the north of Tully, and the uh, Tablelands Mill up on the Atherton Tableland. Anyway, as I say, Tully was uh, in the mix as well there and uh, it didn't have to explore its funding uh, opportunities. The funding opportunities came looking for it fairly aggressively. Uh, Bungie got things uh, moving with a bid in December of 2011, uh, and Mackay Sugar and Kofco were also in the mix. And ultimately, it was uh, Kofco that was, uh, was successful and uh, acquired Tully Sugar for $136 million. The uh, Kofco, uh, during that period, Kofco is a state-owned enterprise, which is one of the compli uh, complicating factors in that, in that bid. Uh, but uh, Kofco set Tully Sugar up, or left Tully Sugar as an autonomous company, which has its own board. Uh, so we have uh, three uh, local board members. Uh, we have uh, currently two uh, Kofco-appointed board members, and we have two independents. Um, the management of Tully Sugar is conducted from Tully itself, so we've got our own uh, corporate headquarters in a weatherboard building in Tully. And uh, Kofco, uh, amongst other things, pledged to uh, expand the Tully Sugar industry. Uh, and and uh, they set about doing that before I got there, and they've uh, continued on. Uh, we've, uh, Tully's acquired... Uh, 550 hectares of uh, cane land, uh, former tree plantations that have been converted back into cane production. Uh, and we now produce cane on over 1,400 hectares. We'll probably deliver about 135,000 tonnes of cane into the mill this year. We're about 6% of our own supply. Um, when, when Tully was, uh, prior to Tully being acquired, this was one of the dilemmas they had. Do they go out and chase the land and bring it back into production or do they invest in their factory because there was not the confidence in the industry to see both things happening at once and if the land wasn't coming back into cane, you didn't really need to uh, upgrade the 15-year-old uh, Commodore that you, you had. You could just put a few more miles on it. Uh, with Kofco there, uh, the clear mandate was to uh, set about making sure that the demand for milling capacity was going to be there and, uh, and so that land was acquired, brought back into cane. I would point out that um, uh, Tully Sugar and Kofco don't intend to become a plantation mill, which is more the style of uh, enterprise that you see in, in uh, Brazil where a mill might be 50-60% of its own supply. Uh, we firmly believe, and there's ample evidence to prove it, that the, uh, the uh, large, competent growers who supply us uh, do a better job of growing cane than we will uh, across the entire area. Um, there have been other areas of uh, investment which are, which are very important in order to bring that cane into the mill in, a, in an efficient way. We run uh, almost 300 kilometres of private railway with those nice little trains that the tourists always tell me about. And I tell them, uh, make sure you stop at the crossing. That little train's a 1,000 tonnes and it won't stop for you. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is we're replacing the, 
the uh, rusty old eight ton uh, or two by four ton units up there and if you could see a close up you'd see uh, why we say uh, uh, we trust in, in rust uh, up there. Rust in a, in a wet tropics uh, is one thing you can certainly rely on. It will get its work done. Those bins are 30 plus years old but uh, we're, we're investing in, in new bins and the coupling that you can see there uh, which is an automatic coupling rather than a pin and link system where someone's got to physically step between each of the 2,100 odd bins that we crush every day uh, to, to uh, pull, it, uh, pull the pin and uh, separate it so that it can go through the tippler. Uh, that's an important investment in capacity because we uh, have to be able to get that cane into our mill uh, in order to, to be able to crush. Um, the boiler on the right there, uh, 12 kilometres of tubes went into that uh, boiler. It's a 40 plus year old boiler and the previous set of tubes have been in there for 18 years and that's a $5 million project that we have just completed uh, recently. Uh, in the uh, evaporator, um, which is the picture on the left, uh, there is some 12 or 13,000 tubes that have been individually knocked out of that uh, evaporator and replaced. That's one of 11 different uh, evaporators that we have. But it's, it's that type of refurbishment that uh, the funding or the access to capital that we've now got from a, from a long-term shareholder is allowing us to, uh, to carry out and complete. And this is the, uh, the reason why. This is uh, where we expect to see uh, area. Last year we harvested uh, just over 26,000 hectares. Uh, this year we're going to be 27,800, 27,900, which is uh, another new record. Uh, and we see that that area is going to go up uh, to uh, just under 30,000 hectares to be harvested. Um, I, I, it's, it's a good thing there's been some rain, I can tell you this, uh, but uh, the wet season up in the, in the wet tropics um, is, is uh, quite something when, in terms of your production. Uh, we cannot harvest cane, we can crush it, but we can't get cane harvested uh, other than between June and November. Uh, year to date rainfall in Tully, just a shade over 3.6 metres. Uh, average is four, record is something like seven. Um, you get an inch of rain over, I remember as a kid in, uh, in uh, growing up near Cowra, you get an inch of rain on a tin roof overnight and uh, you know, you, you hear a drum all night long. You get an inch of rain in Tully and it's like 10 minutes work. It's, uh, it's quite phenomenal, but it, it is important in terms of the production. Uh, we have a defined period in which we can get the crop off. We'd love to run that factory for uh, 11 months of the year, uh, but that's just, not, that's just not practical. We can't harvest in that time. So we've got a pact uh, 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 with the growers. We've got a cooperation that needs to occur with the growers that if we sign up area to our mill, uh, we have to be able to get that, uh, that cane through our mill in the five and a half months that we get to operate between June and November. Uh, we also rely on the farmers to engage sufficient harvesting capacity to be able to deliver that product to our mill uh, in that same period. And this has been the argument that uh, we've been uh, having with growers. Um, you can see there some numbers uh, just in terms of uh, the average capex before and after, uh, the, uh, the capex that we've spent on those major projects that I just uh, mentioned uh, this year and what we expect to spend over the next few years to accommodate that extra area. As a corporate investor uh, or a corporate owner of the business, we're never going to have the same uh, spare capacity or, or excess margin of spare capacity uh, to, to handle the volume of cane that we sign up to the mill that the previous owners will. The previous owners were growers and they would uh, defer dividends, they would uh, uh, take a different perspective than any corporate owner uh, as to how much capacity was really required there. Uh, 
So while the uh, numbers there indicate what I would say is a positive story of investment, uh, of confidence in the industry, in fulfilling the commitments that Cofco made uh, to expand the industry, it hasn't been seen that way by our grower suppliers. Uh, and uh, the finger has been pointed at a foreign investment doing the wrong thing there. Uh, and that's been done publicly, which is something that on the cultural side uh, has taken a little bit of explaining with the people in Beijing. Um, but uh, I would argue, and I, and I do argue this, it's, a, it's, it's not that the owner is foreign, it's that the owner is corporate and they're going to uh, have a different perspective than the previous grower owners of that business as to uh, how they invest their money and how much capacity you have relative to relative to task. Uh, we're also having uh, the, the argument because one of the, uh, one of the aspects is that uh, the quality of cane that we receive uh, makes a real difference in terms of the capacity that we can operate at. And uh, previously the owners of the business uh, were happy to send what the, uh, were happy to receive whatever the owners of the business sent. They were the same people, they didn't argue with themselves about that too much. Uh, because uh, we want the cane with the sugar in it, we don't want all the leaf, uh, the, the root system, the, uh, the tops that comes with it. That is wasted capacity to us. Uh, we are pushing back in terms of quality. Again, I would argue that's what a corporate does, but it's been seen uh, as being the, the foreign owners. So we've got uh, issues to manage in what otherwise has been, I think, a quite a successful entry by a, a foreign uh, operator. Uh, and the maintenance budget, which uh, terrifies me almost every time I look at it, um, these sugar mills are set up uh, in series, not in parallel. Um, uh, it's pretty obvious when you walk through it and look at it, but I had, I had to go and look through it a few times. We operate 90% uh, 90, 90 factory availability for five months and zero factory availability for seven. It's, uh, it's a challenging business model. Uh, and you don't just take one line off uh, in, in the front of the mill. I said I'd touch a little bit on why is Kofco there, what, um, what encouraged them to come and make the investment. <clears throat> and like all government policy, Chinese policy uh, is confusing enough that you can drive a truck through it and, and it's not made easier by translating it into English. Um, the uh, a few things to note in there, um, uh, promoting the transformation of agricultural development uh, in the overall policy. China needs to modernise its agriculture. One of the things that I've noticed uh, since I've been travelling to uh, China in the last couple of years, um, not surprisingly, they cut their cane by hand with the old uh, cane knives. Uh, surprising is, uh, and, and their cane production is down in the southeastern uh, corner Guangxi and Yunnan provinces, uh, northwest of Hong Kong, bordering uh, Vietnam. Uh, surprising is where they get their labour to do that. Uh, they come across uh, the border from Vietnam. So China's got a labour shortage. Who would have thought that with you know, one point something billion people? Um, but they're doing construction, Chinese labour is doing construction jobs. Uh, they need to modernise their agriculture and they are looking at the equipment that we use uh, in the Australian sugar industry. Uh, they're looking at the uh, harvesters. I'm encouraging them to actually look at the planters because they do have small-scale tractors and they, they also plant their cane by hand, but the tractors and uh, planting equipment is much more, uh, much better matched, in my opinion, to their, um, uh, the, uh, the size of the uh, uh, market garden plots that they're growing cane on at this stage. Um, in food security, China will mainly rely on itself uh, to ensure its food supply. So it's very interesting to think about what does that actually mean. I think um, for their staples, and it says there um, uh, for uh, food rations, I take that as meaning staples, that's, a, that's an absolute given. Uh, when you produce 200 and consume 200 million tonnes of rice in a year and world trade is something like 35 million uh, tonnes, where else do you go to get it? Um, the same is true of, uh, in, in a large respect, of their, of their wheat. Uh, China has obviously been able to outsource its production of soybeans. So you had uh, what I think is quite a, a remarkable confluence of events. 
that at the time where Chinese incomes were rising, protein demand was increasing and they were in industrialising their meat production, um, Brazil and Argentina had seen their currencies devalue, were opening up a huge amount of new land to come into, amongst other things, soybean production. Uh, and as China went from hardly any soybean imports to 70 million tonnes, uh, Brazil and Argentina were there to supply that. Um, I'm not sure that those moons will align again to allow that to happen if China needed to come out and get its corn, in, uh, extra corn in that way from, from the world. Uh, but I do think sugar is one of the things that, uh, that they can uh, come and, uh, come and uh, get from other parts of the world. Uh, I, I think China understands uh, that food security is not just security of its own supplies, but um, that it does not uh, weigh in and disrupt the rest of the world too much when it needs, uh, when it needs to go out into the world for uh, some, of the, some of the additional food that it's going to go and get. Uh, I should say that is, again, that is uh, my interpretation of Chinese policy. It's not uh, strictly Kofko's view. It's what I've gleaned from, uh, uh, well, from 20 years in, in, uh, in the market and from uh, the number of years I've, I've been uh, working uh, in Tully Sugar and Kofko. Um, there is also the going out strategy, which is uh, linking up with agricultural markets, which China has done very successfully uh, in, in soybeans, as I mentioned. Uh, cotton would be another example, but uh, they're moving further into the supply chain. Uh, and, and they're looking uh, through that process uh, to be able to understand how do those supply chains work, how do they, um, how do they uh, link up and become more, more efficient uh, with their substantial invest investments and increasing investments in uh, processing capacity, be that soybean crushing plants, uh, sugar refineries, uh, uh, industrialised uh, meat production. Um, all, all Chinese policy seems to have mutually beneficial cooperation in it somewhere. So Kofko's investment uh, in, in Tully Sugar, as I, as I said at uh, the outset, it was their first major agricultural investment where they were 100% owner. Um, subsequently, they've gone on to make investments recently in both Nidera and uh, Noble, but those companies operate in many different parts of the, uh, around the globe. And uh, Kofko's investment there is as a majority shareholder of 51%, but in Tully they are 100%. Uh, it was an investment uh, in the supply chain uh, to, to link up with the potential investment, investment uh, in sugar refining. One of the things that uh, is evident, uh, and it's evident to us by the uh, interns that come and visit us, is that they want to understand how uh, a modern, not in 25 model, no, a modern sugar mill actually operates. So, uh, my uh, chief operating officer and I were both, uh, he's an engineer, we were both in uh, China a couple of weeks ago and looking at their mills compared to ours, we've had a lot of visitors who understand something of what our mill looks like compared to those, but very few uh, of, of our people have, have gone over until now. Uh, and, and one of the things that is most striking again is, again, is around labour. Uh, our mills are operated by guys in control rooms uh, pushing mice around, pushing pushing a mouse around on a desk. Uh, their mills are operated uh, by guys on the floor telling many, many, many poor pe more people on the floor, uh, open that valve a little bit, pull back on that one, more steam over here, yes, no, uh, lift the boiling temperature, it's, it's manual. Uh, so the uh, circa $800,000 investment we're about to make in, in upgrading our control system uh, is something that they're very interested in. Um, it also goes some way to uh, explaining why uh, when you benchmark the Tully sugar mill against uh, a similar size mill in Beihai in China or a brand new mill in uh, Chongzhou that's not automated, you get uh, different outcomes from different parts of the factory. Uh, and on the right hand side, um, the return on investment is something that uh, Kofko um, reminds me of at, at every opportunity. Um, they are a strategic investor, they're there for, uh, to, to be able to get access to product through the supply chain and they're there to learn. Uh, 
but particularly since uh, the, the uh, new um, political regime has come in in China, um, uh, they're, they're very clear that uh, it's not about going out and just uh, splurging money. So Barry, you don't have anything to worry about, or I don't have that problem to worry about, that they're, they're just ha handing out cash left, right and centre. Um, it's, uh, it's really quite something uh, to see uh, how much this has come to the fore and, and what austerity means in China. Um, the two things uh, struck me on my last trip to China, which as I say was only a couple of weeks ago. Uh, one, uh, lunch and dinner were in the company campaign, uh, canteen. Uh, previously lunch was always in the canteen at the mill, but uh, dinner was you know, somewhere quite a bit flasher. Um, and uh, this, the, the austerity in China is very real and um, that's something I'll be talking to, the, uh, to my guys about as we formulate budgets for the coming years. Um, the other thing uh, that I do when I travel, and even my wife thinks I'm strange, uh, not just because of this, but um, I, I go to supermarkets. Uh, we're in the business of producing uh, raw sugar. We don't make food, but uh, it, it goes into food. I go looking for those packs and see what does it end up looking like in China. And um, in my years of visiting supermarkets in, in different parts of the world and, and in China, uh, there is a noticeable difference. Um, they exist, that's new, um, but uh, obviously in Beijing they've existed for a while, but the range of products that they're carrying and, uh, and the way they're packaged, presented, uh, that's all changing too. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something, uh, not that I see a, a huge amount of uh, number of real shoppers in the room, but uh, it is something that you can uh, get, a bit of a, uh, get, a, get a bit of a handle on uh, what's happening in this industry. Um, the reinvestment of those earnings, uh, we haven't paid a dividend to the shareholder and I don't think we will while we're uh, accommodating the commitments that have been made. Um, it's being reinvested in the business uh, and um, uh, some of the bankers in the room would, uh, would also know there's a little bit more appetite for, for debt uh, in, a, in a more commercial business than with the conservative former ownership. So um, a few changes. Um, uh, Funding is one of them. The cultural ones uh, that I've uh, touched on as well are also very fascinating. Thank you.